Hey folks, we've got um, time to start. Uh, it's good to see everybody. And if you don't mind for a second tagline, I've got, um, I'd like to welcome everybody. I got about a three and a half minute introduction to put things in context. Okay, so if you are an old timer to the science circle or a newcomer, I'd like to welcome you here. As I said, I've got about a, a short introduction to put things in context, and then we'll open up the floor to you or to um, Dr. Hendricks. So what we're doing today is kind of an experiment. Um, there may be other names for the concept, but at least in the US, the fireside chat began with President Roosevelt back in 1933. During his speech on that day when he was sworn in as president, he famously remarked that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Well, we have the virus to fear today, but um, at the same time, a lot of it is in our minds as far as uh, what we do about it and how we fear and how we react with everybody else. So instead of delivering a speech from the podium as he had to when he was inaugurated, the president wanted to find a way to acknowledge the fears and concerns of the people during the Great Depression. And so he turned to a less formal approach, which was the fireside chat. Now though he delivered it by radio, the fireside chat concept was supposed to simulate him sitting among uh, the people in their living rooms, talking with them rather than at them. And so if we fast forward about 90 years, back in President Roosevelt's day, uh, the radio was the newest technology and it allowed him and then other leaders to speak directly to the people uh, for the very first time in history. That was amazing, albeit, one way. So today we have technologies that enable us to speak and to uh, chat together, right, as we've been doing this morning. And not, so not just hear someone speak, but be able to respond as well. And in the virtual world, we can even uh, make a fireplace, <laughs> have us all sit around it. Okay, so why are we here? Well, once more, the world faces a crisis together, much like it did back in the days of the uh, Great Depression. One year ago, the World Health Organization recognized that there was a novel coronavirus that was starting to spread around the world. That was only one year ago. And today we're fast approaching 100 million known cases of the virus uh, infection. The virus itself is called SARS-CoV-2, and that number is likely much higher than that because that's just the known cases, the reported cases. In addition, over 2 million people have died from the effects of COVID-19. That's the name of the disease, and there's no indication that the spread of the virus is slowing down anytime soon. So back in 1918, there was a novel h one uh, H1N1 flu virus that eventually infected 500 million people worldwide, killing at least 50 million. That number again may be higher because we didn't have the medical knowledge or health and social systems that we have today. So today in, in 2020 or 2021, many nations have taken drastic steps to try to contain the spread of the virus because they don't want to overwhelm healthcare systems and revert basically back to where we were in 20, uh, 1920, depending on you know, the immune systems and how people live and such today. So these necessary actions have caused economic, social, and emotional hardships for millions of people, but we've kept the death toll to, from reaching what it did back in the 1918, 19. Yeah, it is, that's a huge amount of people. Um, we've kept the death toll down. Now one bright piece of news 
is that wearing masks and social isolating or social distancing has drastically reduced the impact of the flu this season. And so we've actually, the flu season is not as bad as it's been in the past because people have basically been doing what they should for all viruses, at least airborne ones. Okay, so however, while technologies have changed, people have not really changed that much for the most part. And so our need to work and to socialize have greatly complicated the situation and perpetuated the pandemic, as well as, of course, broadcast um, uh, that's a good question, Shiloh, and I'm not sure, but that's why Dr. Hendricks is here. <laughs> the flu is flown. Um, while some countries have brought it under control, the virus is virtually out of control in other countries. And this is a lot of, about um, both the countries and their, the way people look toward collective or individualism and uh, the methods taken and lots of other factors. So over the past two weeks, uh, Dr. Hendricks presented what we know about the virus and vaccines and how people get sick. And I presented the social aspects of the environments. Now, you can see both of our presentations, if you haven't already, um, on the Science Circle site. Uh, if you click on there, you have Dr. Hendricks and then mine is at the other link. And so today, what we'd like to do is, um, I don't know if Dr. Hendricks has a few things, but today we'd like to open the floor to you as in the nature of the fireside chat to understand what your fears and concerns and questions are. And we'll either try to answer your questions here or try to find answers for you. And yeah, uh, that's exactly uh, uh, Shiloh, is that in some cases because of behavior and such, the systems are overtaxed. In Los Angeles, for example, in California, um, they actually had to do basically triage. In other words, they were telling ER, or not ER people, but EMT people that don't bring people who are not likely to survive to the hospital because there's really no room for them. That's, just, that's, a, that's what we're trying to avoid because then the health system fails them because people didn't cooperate. And sometimes there's no ready-made answers. We, we don't promise to have answers for you. It's because it's not as simple as that, but we can at least face this all together. So now what we're gonna do, maybe Dr. Hendricks has a few things, but uh, what we're gonna do is open the floor to you is you can, you can chat. We're not gonna be able to talk because we're talking through another, um, media, but any related topic is welcome. The only thing I would ask is that we make this a civil conversation. Okay, no, um, try not to point fingers at governments or peoples or whatever, because that's not terribly helpful. What We would like to talk about what your fears and concerns and questions are. So what's on your mind? And I'll turn this over to Dr. Hendricks, if he has anything, and then uh, to the, um, to any of you. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'll respond to that one thing is that um, her immunity may be closer to what it says with Dr. Fauci there, it all depends. And her immunity can be reached two different ways, either through vaccines or through the hard way with everybody getting it. Dr. Hendricks, do you have anything? Otherwise, uh, open it to the audience. Yeah, I actually sat down this morning and wrote out scribbled notes. I have three pages that look like I was on drugs. But uh, a few points. I'd like to make one about the 1920 flu. Uh, most of them um, were felt to die of um, pneumonia from their point of view back then. There was, I think it was pertussis suis was a um, uh, co-factor um, bacterial uh, infection that was secondary to the influenza virus. And it was present in most of the patients that were autopsied and died 
the United States lost or had about 500,000 people die. By about two and a half weeks, it is suspected that the United, that the United States will have 500,000 dead from COVID. Uh, we had just crossed 400,000 before the 20th of January, and I think we're already up to four, 400,000, um, uh, 413,000 or more. We're having about 4,000 deaths a day now. So it's accelerating. There are some points I want to make. Um, one about uh, variants. The uh, Danes are doing sequencing of everything. I read a recent article. Um, the, the Danes were looking... Um, with their sequencing at the increase in cases related to this new variant, uh, B.1.1.7. It's, uh, I'll just call it the London variant. It's London and Southeast England is where it seemed to begin. And it had a little litany of mutations. You know, this M type RNA, this positive sense RNA that is the genetic information for coronavirus has 30,000 bases on it. And when it gets replicated, it has a frame uh, uh, spell checking function, which is pretty remarkable, but it still makes a lot of mistakes. It's way longer than one would predict without a some kind of a checking mechanism for a um, an infectious organism to have uh, reliable replication and not get lost. Um, but um, it can mutate pretty quickly. And uh, it's, um, it's one of the tragedies that uh, it has not been taken more seriously and controlled more aggressively from the beginning, because the longer it goes, the more chance it has every petri dish on two legs that gets infected is a potential source of new mutations and um, single strand cells you mean single strand RNA it's the length of the RNA that is the issue uh, in terms of mutations uh, 15,000 bases would be about the limit of most uh, mathematical models for um, a virus to be able to replicate itself without getting too screwed up. Um, but uh, at any rate, from the end of 2020, um, they noted about 2% of what they were sequencing in Denmark was um, this English variant. And that's gone up to 7% by the second week of January. Um, so that's, you know, increasing by about 70% a week, which is pretty significant. Um, the United States only has been sequencing about 0.3% of cases. So they're rated 43rd in the world in terms of sequencing what's out there. So, um, the United States, maybe that'll change now, but we don't really know what we're dealing with. Uh, it's like the thing in the movies where the guy says, you have any idea who I am? <laughs> I'm SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> At any rate, um, this new variant, even... Uh, bore, um, um, Boris Johnson uh, acknowledged on Friday this new variant may be more deadly, and it's in fact felt to be 30% more infectious and uh, 30 to 70%, it might be as high, um, uh, more contagious. The uh, mutations in the spike protein make it more, have more affinity for the uh, ACE2 receptors. Um, it's predicted that uh, in the U 
you know, this UK um, B.1.1.7 strain will be dominant in, by mid-February. And the CDC is predicting with apparently limited information that it will be prevalent in the United States by March. Basically, we're facing a tsunami. There's been something of a drop in the original uh, virus. Now, I, I would say that oh, around June of last year, uh, a variant called D614G became the dominant variant worldwide. For some reason, it was much more effective and uh, spread on, took up all the available niches out competing the original genome um, or infectious agent, uh, but it's now being replaced. Uh, basically, these variants are hiding in the overall numbers and the reproduction ratio is deceptively low um, because you have this um, more infectious variant that's underneath the surface, getting ready to come up at a, as a big wave. We also have the variants of the um, Brazil uh, has some, uh, uh, let's see, P1, P period one, also known as B period one period, one period 248. Um, it's devastated the Amazon the Amazon is said to be um, uh, to have a collapsed medical care system. They are overwhelmed, and uh, um, it gets to where people that get seriously ill have no place to go, like Phil was describing in in um, um, California. Now, Brazil has been working with this uh, CoronaVac uh, from the Beijing-based uh, Sinovac um, company, um, which is, an, it's very traditional, an inactivated vaccination uh, or inactivated infectious particles. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of ways, like you can take tetanus, which is a toxin, and... Uh, modify it a bit so it's still has some of the same antigenicity and it won't be the neurotoxin that uh, uh, we normally have. So tetanus vaccine is super effective. It's not a living agent. It's an extract, an exotoxin from um, a clostridium uh, organism, a soil organism. Um, and so at any rate, using inactivated uh, virus or inactivated ethical, uh, inactivated uh, infectious particles is very traditional. It was thought to be much more effective and, and even as 78% uh, or more earlier on, but recently Brazil um, has re reported that it's only 50.4% effective at preventing severe and mild COVID-19 in these late stage trials. And that's of interest to Turkey and um, Indonesia who are using this, uh, this uh, vaccine. Johnson & Johnson, uh, I see Shiloh mentions that, they're coming out with another, a fairly traditional, uh, sort of like the AstraZeneca and the um, Sputnik V. Uh, both of those use uh, adenovirus uh, vectors. And so does the Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson has uh, one shot, supposedly. I have no numbers on how, it's, uh, how effective it is. Uh, the adenovirus um, vaccines are usually a safe um, method for getting the virus in. It gets taken into the cell and then um, releases DNA into the nucleus through a complex of proteins around what are called nucleopores, uh, nucleoporin complex. Uh, and the DNA uses the cell's equipment to, to, to make messenger RNA that then produces spike proteins. 
Um, Jag, quick, uh, quick question. Is Siri asked, once someone gets the vaccine or gets COVID, uh, how long are they immune? I know we don't have a lot of data. Oh, but. That's, that's one of three big questions. Uh, it, uh, they tend to protect, first off, they, these tend to not protect you from getting uh, the virus, but uh, it seems, but protects you from getting disease. These are quite uh, effective, and, and it appears, especially these messenger RNA viruses, uh, uh, vaccines like Moderna and Pfizer, and BioNTech. Um, but, um, and I talked a little bit about the, this fascinating new development of mRNA vaccines. That's really very cool, and it's in its infancy, but... Uh, uh, it appears likely that people will still be able to spread the disease. They'll still be able to have the virus on board. They may not get sick from it. Having an infection means more than just having the presence of the, um, of an infectious agent. It means you have an inflammatory response to it and you get that you have the disease. Well, so people can be carriers without being sick. So the vaccine appears to keep people from getting sick. And as far as anyone knows, they're thinking months, maybe many months. Um, no one knows for sure how long the vaccines will work. And it's in part because of what, how effectively it makes, um, um, you know, from the plasma cell uh, population uh, or the B cell population, plasma cells that become memory cells and the other ones that become antibody producing cells. Those memory cells, how long will they last? Uh, if we're lucky, a lifetime, but um, no one's that optimistic, I don't think. Uh, quick question, coming back to the vaccine is that we know that the distribution isn't what would like it to be. And sometimes people have only been getting one dose. Do they have to get two doses within a certain period of time for it to be effective or how does that work? Um, it appears when you look at the graphs of antibody response, you usually get a little response and then you get the second dose and you get a, boot, a, a big kick. Uh, so the ones that are recommending, like I think Sputnik is one month apart, Sputnik five, the AstraZeneca, I think is, um, supposed to be four weeks apart. Uh, the Moderna is four weeks apart and, uh, cause that's messenger RNA and the uh, Pfizer is three weeks apart. Um, but, um, if you don't get the second dose, you're, that as no one's guaranteeing that you're going to have an optimal response. You might have a feeble response. You might have a strong response, but uh, it's not as likely, I, I would guess. And um, one other thing I wanted to, well, two things. I, one is the uh, nanoparticles. That's with polyethylene glycol. Uh, that's, really very cool. Uh, it's a nanoparticle uh, that, uh, you know, if, if you, um, I, I didn't talk last week about treatments. When people really get sick, what they can do is uh, um, they, they have, you know, the supportive care uh, that anyone would get based on organ systems and how they're functioning and what is failing, particularly respiratory system and respiratory support. Uh, and in some cases, uh, uh, they get disseminated intravascular coagulation, blood clotting uh, disorders and such. Uh, but uh, uh, giving monoclonal antibodies is uh, a big thing in this uh, that has potential and is probably going to have a niche in it and also remdesivir 
uh, remdesivir is approved by the FDA for people over 12 years of age and has an emergency use authorization for people under 12. It's um, uh, given IV. It's an, a nucleotide prodrug of an adenosine analog, and it binds to the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which when the um, COVID um, mRNA or it's, I guess I shouldn't call it an mRNA, the COVID RNA gets into the cytosol and starts to make protein. It makes complexes that kind of have protease activity that cut themselves up into its uh, 16 uh, pieces. And um, uh, one of the functions of that protein complex is to act as an RNA it's RNA dependent, of course, RNA polymerase. So it can make a negative, MR, a negative um, RNA strand um, and um, then start making uh, uh, positive strand copies for new viruses. Um, this uh, remdesivir gives a false uh, signal to it to cease transcription. So um, it tricks it. And it does tend to decrease viral load and uh, um, the severity of uh, the disease in most of the... Uh, um, let's see, there's a question here. If you, you do not need a vaccine, if your own immune system took care of your immunity against a virus... Um, Well, you can always take your chances, and uh, you're, uh, if you're wrong, it's sort of like um, John Kennedy once uh, was, has said uh, they want to cut military spending. What if they're wrong? Well, it's, if you're, they're wrong and they cut it, and you get attacked, you've really made a big mistake. Uh, that was back in the 60s. That was a good general strategy. Uh, this thing kills people and people like Rebecca Jones, who's a whistleblower in Florida who used to work with the um, human, uh, I guess the uh, Department of Human Services there in uh, Florida, keeping, she was a data analysis, keeping track of COVID cases. And they tried to force her to give false information. So she got fired and she kept on doing it. So she's getting harassed by the state of Florida and legally uh, because she's doing it independently, um, tracking COVID in the state. And they don't want people to really know it would seem. Uh, she got COVID. She was arrested and they tested her and she had COVID. And she wrote that she's 31 and she's super healthy and a mother and all this. And um, uh, it's hit her like a freight train and nobody wants this. And so uh, some young people die of this and they don't necessarily have autoimmune disorders or known problems. Um, what would uh, somebody do if uh, they did have an autoimmune disorder, just have to do what they normally do? In other words, um, some people with really bad problems have to socially isolate the whole time. Isn't that right? Yes, and in fact, if you have the vaccine and even assuming it's effective because you may still carry the virus, the same precautions apply because otherwise you may act in spreading the virus. Uh, I think the autoimmune disorder would depend on what you're talking about. If it's um, things like HIV, uh, I think the... Um, ability of the um, uh, vaccine to induce effective antibody response may be pretty d damaged because T helper cells, CD4 T helper cells are attenuated. So if HIV is well controlled, they may still be able to um, have some immune response for people like that. Uh, now, now um, two companies make monoclonal antibodies. And let me just tell you about 
monoclonal antibodies. You know, myeloma is a like a cancer of um, B cells. When I was practicing early and then training, I took care of patients that had plasma cytomas, which were a form of myeloma that uh, malignant myeloma that had solid tumors, particularly in skeleton. And I saw some of the cases that I still can see in front of my eyes, in a sense. Uh, there's some cases you never forget that are extremely sad and uh, painful to watch, and you can't do anything. And um, then sometimes you see people over treat and do harm to people that have terrible situations. And at any rate, I had deep memories about dealing with plasma cytomas, but at any rate, you get mice with uh, myeloma cells, which are immortal. They're, they're like cancer cells, they divide without stopping, sort of like HeLa cells. And you can get cells, most any somatic cells to fuse. Uh, there's two ways. When I was first studying and, and um, given courses in immunology, they talked about um, using viruses that cause syncytial changes, cause fusing of plasma membranes. Um, there's a Sendai virus, which is commonly used uh, to cause two different cell types to fuse. Uh, but you can also do it with polyethylene glycol, which, by the way, is the um, uh, lipid that's used in the nanoparticle for the mRNA virus uh, vaccines. And so you get these uh, myeloma cells to uh, fuse with B cells, and you get the B cells from, uh, um, are you able to hear me okay? Um, yeah, you're coming okay. in fine, at least for me. Okay. Um, these um, um, B cells often from the spleen uh, that are producing antibodies, and you choose myeloma cells that are not choosing, uh, that are not producing antibodies, and you can cause them to fuse, and you can use techniques derived from bacteriology by which you do serial dilutions and isolate clones, isolate single cells for cloning in cell culture. These are not bacterial cultures. These are mammalian cell cultures. And um, these will produce antibodies. Now, they've gotten fancier if you take murine or mouse antibodies and inject them in humans, you're going to get a response. So there have been, well, I just say they've introduced DNA into these cells such that uh, the antibodies produced, and these are all the same antibody with, uh, have murine um, um uh, variable areas where they contact the antigen uh, and the um, um, stable areas, which um, uh, are basically human. So they're mostly human molecules. And um, uh, so um, they can mass produce these. It's really quite remarkable that the industry can do this. And uh, um, Eli Lilly produces a single monoclonal um, antibody um, uh, injection. They went into a nursing home and did like 962 people. And they had a placebo group and um, they had four people die, but those were all the placebo group and they prevented and serious disease actually prevented the other nursing home people from getting serious disease with the monoclonal antibodies infused at the outset. Um, the um, quick, quick question is okay. that um, you're talking about different um, ways to help people. Going back to vaccines, okay. how do they produce so many? How do they produce so many? In other words, they need to ramp up production. How do they even produce as many as they have? And is it more a question of 
production or distribution. In other words, I could give one country 100 million doses, but they may not be able to distribute them in well enough or keep them in the conditions they need, that kind of stuff. Well, let me answer that in one second. I'll just finish. Uh, Regeneron has a two anti monoclonal antibody cocktail, and Eli Lilly has a single monoc monoclonal antibody uh, that can be used early in an infection with remdesivir. And um, you can't use like this hydroxychloroquine is frankly, to me, a fraud. Uh, but if you use that with the remdesivir, you can have um, Im impede the effects. Um, so they can't be used together. Um, but the, um, at any rate, uh, aside from supportive care, along with dexamethasone, like top politicians who have gotten sick, they get in the hospital, that's what they've been treated with. And that's how they've survived. Um, I don't think, I think we would have had a dead president uh, several months ago had these modalities not been available. And one other aspect of this before I, I, I move on is that um, if you get the monoclonal antibodies, that's going to interfere probably with the effectiveness or the take of being vaccinated because instead of... Um, the um, product of the vaccine, when it's processed by the cells that take it up and they produce the spike proteins, they, they will be blocked by the monoclonal antibodies that are in there passively. And you want people to build up their own immunity uh, if they can. Um, now, in terms of the vaccines, uh, this messenger RNA it really is pretty remarkable that they've been able to produce as much. I think the main problem now is uh, distribution. Uh, I think that's one advantage that Sputnik V and AstraZeneca and perhaps uh, Johnson & Johnson using an adenovirus uh, DNA um, uh, genome um, adenovirus uh, vector, uh, that doesn't require extreme um, uh, uh, temperature restrictions and handling. It's more typical of what's been done for a long time. But um, I think humans are going to have to get it together and become more organized. And um, the other thing is some of this is in its infancy. I was thinking this morning about um, well, that's a good question. Uh, the mRNA, uh, it's, it survives the same as MR, mRNA from the nucleus that's been transcribed from the person's own genome. So I think it'd be a matter of, uh, uh, it's just going down common pathways that work. Um, I don't know how to answer that beyond that. Uh, everything gets degraded at some point, but that's, uh, that's maybe in the dynamics. Um, uh, uh, downstream of where it does its action. Uh, I woke up, I, I don't want to dominate this completely, but I, I woke up with this idea about you know, the military is, uh, and war and uh, strife and conflict have often been stimulus for progress. Uh, not everything the military does is, uh, um, uh, leads to, you know, deadlier weapons. Uh, you think of things like canned food, um, microwave ovens, duct tape, super glue, internet, GPS positioning, digital cameras, those are all sort of beta tested and uh, uh, subsidized in their early development by military um, or military needs. 
Um, similarly, you think of radar. Um, radar seems a simple idea. If someone were blind and they uh, maybe had great hearing and they bounced a ball off a wall, they could hear where it bounced and they could develop a spatial sense of how close that wall is and what its shape is. And um, radar is sort of like that, but you think of radar and all the spinoffs from radar, including recently there's this thing called a finder device for disaster and emergency response. It uses radar to detect people whose hearts are beating underneath rubble in places where there have been earthquakes. And that's being improved. It's already been demonstrated and there's a fancier systems like a, a radar system called Ginger, guidance and intro, uh, I'm sorry, guidance and into the ground exploration radar that studies the surface of planets. Uh, and that all came about just trying to figure when planes are going to come and drop bombs on us uh, from World War II. You know, radars got ubiquitous. Anybody ever had a ticket by a cop standing with a little device in his hand? He says, I got you. You know, well, anyway, who here ever heard of cold chain before six months ago? Has anybody? Cold chain. And now it's part of the vernacular in English. Cold chain. It's a, it's, it's a requirement for uh, these messenger RNA-based um, nanoparticle vaccines. And it's cryogenics technology. And that's putting demand on cryogenics to develop more. And uh, that's cryogenics and nanotechnology are going to <laughs> uh, cryogenics and nanotechnology are going to, going to be exploding, I think now, because of um, what's required to make messenger RNA viruses or messenger RNA um, vaccines work, because they seem to work so well. If you can get the system up and running. We've really done well in just a year to put this together after sequencing it about a year ago, but that shows how far along we are technologically and scientifically. You know, in 1880, uh, Dewar, he was experimenting and he, he, he discovered that mercury would vaporize and condense on the surface of the glass surface of these containers. He had tried all these different things to try to keep stuff cold because he was trying to do chemistry in very cold circumstances and it mostly failed. But the, the Dewar flask was quite successful and then eventually silvered uh, glass on the inside of these containers was the best thing for keeping things cold. That was only 1880. And um, he was experimenting with th with um, liquefied uh, air and he found the mirrored glass kept it from evaporating as fast. Um, now they have like cryogenics fluid dynamics, cryo FD, which has, um, uh, can double the cooling power of cryo coolers and decrease boil off of helium stored in South at the South pole and liquid helium can be available year round. Um, Superconducting magnets at CERN depend on cryogenics. Um, yeah. Of course we got uh, uh, Walt Disney and Ted Williams going to bring them back, but um at any rate, I think there's going to be some exciting developments in um, um, science and technology as the world gears up for these new technologies and new capabilities, and um, it expands. These are the very first ever um, 
approved vaccines, approved for, uh, authorized for uh, emergency use. Uh, and it's only the beginning. And those work in the 90% level. The Sputnik reportedly works at about 92%, but I can't find numbers. All I, all I can find are press releases from the Russian government about Sputnik 5. Uh, they asked if um, they, uh, let's see, about uh, should we wait for the first dose if we're not sure if we can get the second? What would you answer to that? I think most places are giving you a second uh, of an appointment outright. And I think I would be optimistic if they um, offer it and they give you a second appointment to come back for your uh, booster dose or your second dose, go for it. There's no choice. You get what you get. Uh, if you're in a rural area, you're probably going to get Moderna. Uh, if in, in the United States, if you're in uh, a city or out of a larger hospital, you can probably get the Pfizer. Um, but uh, uh, you do get some protection, maybe 50%. Uh, it's um, and and yeah, I think this uh, with the full dosage two weeks after you've had it, uh, you're up to ninety five percent. Although these variants out of Brazil, South Africa, and England uh, help uh, give escape uh, vaccine escape. Uh, by um, uh, making the antibodies less effective in neutralizing the uh, virus. So um, we're watching that very cl closely and um, we may be in for a hell of a time still. Um, I have a couple of social questions really quick. First of all, um, there are nations, that, and, and people can answer this if they'd like, but uh, there are nations that are giving compensation to people who get the vaccine, but there are also nations who, there's a good article this morning, and giving, and then some are giving compensation to people who get sick. So I under, you know, I understand kind of the rationale between that, but I, my understanding is if they give it to people who get sick, there may be an incentive to get sick <laughs> rather than get the vaccine. Have you heard of that? Or they're, they're giving people incentive to get sick? Well, they're, okay, if you get, they're not giving it to get sick, but if you get COVID, then you get money uh, to make up for lost pay and stuff like that. I could see that as a kind of like, well, gee, I may as well get sick. That way I don't have to work and they still get more money. That It's kind of like the $600 per week checks, and they actually found that that was more than um, people earned for unemployment. Yeah, very risky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I, the, the whole thing about herd immunity um, is in the United States, which is one of the less populous countries, it's, uh, let's say, for ease of a computation, 300 million. Herd immunity without intervention, um, or even with intervention, I think, would uh, without vaccine would result in about 3 million deaths at least. And um, the cost to society is um, staggering. And... Um, uh, it's it's uh, it's not an enviable way to go. Um, I heard another question about uh, right now the vaccines are for, are for sixteen and older. What about people that are under sixteen? In other words, about schools and such like that. Uh, I know Moderna. I'm sure Pfizer too are uh, working on um, uh, studies. Uh, so they can get authorization for younger. Uh, it's tricky to give things to uh, younger children that um, 
you know, they have such, they have a different metabolism and they're undergoing quick development and a lot of uh, DNA expression that's not a problem in the adult who's already mature and developed. So uh, if you bugger that up, you can cause terrible problems. Uh, just think of thalidomide, which was given for morning sickness to pregnant women. That it, it doesn't take very much to uh, um, disrupt embryogenesis and developmental uh, changes when they're happening at an exponential rate. Just can you confirm this one thing? Is that there's always something in the news, but uh, there and I and I mentioned not to try to politicize this thing, but there were people saying that. President Biden didn't wear a mask at the Lincoln Memorial. And so they were saying, well, why didn't he do that? But my, you know, Lincoln doesn't have COVID. In other words, my understanding is masks are not something you have to wear everywhere, but they're to, you wear them when there's a chance that the virus is around. In other words, there's people there. Is that correct? Well, yeah, I, I, that was outdoors for one thing, and I don't think anyone was very close to him. And I, uh, uh, um, I think that some of this stuff gets pulled out to um, be vindictive or, you know, critical on a kind of a petty level. Uh, if somebody doesn't have their mask on, I wouldn't, because I see that in a picture unless they're at a big gathering and there's a people wall to wall with no masks and it's current, that's pretty worrisome. Uh, but uh, someone's got their picture taken in the news and they don't have a mask on at that moment. Uh, I would want to know the situation and the exact conditions before I made uh, criticism of that. Uh, so, I don't know. You're always going to have people that are pit bulls and on the attack. I have one other thing that occurred to me I wanted to tell you about just real quickly that I learned I wasn't aware of, but B cells, you know, uh, B cells are kind of um, uh, what we want to stimulate with our vaccine to uh, um, uh, undergo proliferation and uh, and um, when when a specific B cell type gets stimulated because of the um, um, MH2 uh, uh, histocompatibility molecule that's on it uh, and it, it gets uh, interacts with a compatible uh, T helper cell. <clears throat> it um, starts to pro proliferate to make a clone of cells. And some of those become memory cells and some become um, um, uh, plasma cells that produce antibodies. Um, a mature B cell has some ability to employ slight mutations to alter the antibody it produces so that it can respond. Sometimes those will be responsive to changes in an antigen if they're not too extreme. It's, um, I thought that was quite remarkable and it's about the only place I know where mature cells change their genetic um, uh, basis and their expression um, in the human body. So mature B cells that are producing antibodies can adjust a little bit randomly. And some of those random changes will be um, able to target a slight random change in an antigen. So you got that going for you. And I thought that was very cool. Speaking of distribution, one of the things I read uh, this morning also was that in some of the poorer nations where 
production, well, not production, but distribution may come later. In other words, what, what happened was uh, my understanding with some of the richer nations kind of bought up some of the first production and uh, places in Africa and other places that may not have the uh, same infrastructure or money may not get the vaccine until around 2023. Have you read that? Well, yeah, I think that the mRNA vaccines, cool as they are, are going to be um, probably mostly available to uh, the well-to-do. And um, for countries that are um, uh, more strapped, uh, they're going to be dependent on a good workhorse vaccine like AstraZeneca or uh, a Sputnik or maybe the Johnson & Johnson, which is stable and easy. All those are the adenovirus uh, vector uh, containing DNA. Uh, and very traditional kind of viral uh, vaccine. And um, uh, they're cheaper to make, and um, they're stable and easy to distribute and don't require cold chain, anything like, and they, I think they need to be cool, like refrigerator cool. But that's easy compared to negative 70 degrees centigrade what can so, you say about the Chinese uh, virus? I understand that uh, perhaps Brazil and, and other places have been using it. The, well, the, the vaccine uh, from the, the um, let's see, the company, Sinovac, uh, it's a Coronavac uh, vaccine. It's an inactivated SARS-CoV-2 but recently it appears it's only effective. I mean, it's pretty safe, but only effective at about 50 point, let's see, I wrote it 50.4%, 50, 50.4%. 5, 0. Just barely over half the patients are benefited um, in terms of protection from getting sick. So, that's quite a disappointment. And Brazil is uh, really hurting right now. Now, the, again, Sputnik, uh, again, you know, like in phase two, um, phase one and two, you uh, tend to use healthy patients and then you start to go to uh, um, uh, a, a, a a population of test patients that represent the demographic um, and uh, they have some sick people. Uh, and I don't know how much the Russian virus uh, uh, vaccine was tested that way. Um, I can't tell from anything I read. Uh, I hope it's 92% uh, effective and it probably is safe. Uh, Again, because of it's uh, a traditional um, platform, vaccine platform. But uh, um, I think that those cheaper, uh, solid uh, technology, established technology and easier to distribute and st stable platforms are going to be the uh, um, uh, thing that saves lots of um, countries that don't have the infrastructure and money to go for Moderna and Pfizer thus far. As I understand Moderna, no, maybe it's AstraZeneca. I think it's AstraZeneca is, no, maybe it is Moderna. Moderna said they're not going to take profits until this uh, pandemic is uh, solid and um, uh, under control. So they are kind of producing it at cost, which is good of them. But uh, at any rate, um, okay, that's a that's, good. Um, by the way, we try to uh, for you that have been to our presentations, and there's a big audience today. Is that we try to wrap everything up within about an hour, but we don't want to. For the whole purpose of the fireside chat 
is to address things that are of concern to you. So if we have missed one of your questions, there you go. How long until the research is stolen? Well, you know, um, secrets are the fleeting of things. Um, but is there any questions, anything we've missed, anything that chat, chat's been very, very busy, so we may have missed something, please um, repeat or uh, send it again. We want to make sure we get to everybody if possible. I have one quick comment. Are you hearing me in real time? Or is there a delay? Uh, that's hard to tell. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, um, but at least we're here. <laughs> and how long until research is stolen? You know, if somebody had snuck into Isaac Newton's um, uh, study and um, surreptitiously made a copy of his Principia and um, then went out and tried to do anything with it, good luck to him. And it's sort of the same with this, uh, the technology for producing these things is not trivial and not just that, but just to get it out there and have quality control and distribution and an acceptance of it. Uh, I don't think theft of the, you know, proprietary, um, uh, interests are are of course important to the industries um the, the the bean counters in these industries but i don't think theft of these ideas is going to help anybody in the short run these are too damned involved to create produce distribute and administer it's like you know it's like if you happen to eavesdrop on Beethoven playing the piano, so you're going to steal his song? Good luck with that. Does that make sense? That's me. Okay, um, we might want to wrap everything up, um, but here again, we don't want to miss anything. But thank you very much. Wow, this is a huge audience. Thank you very much. This is an important concern for everybody. And... The best thing we can do is to get together and agree on how best to make this work so the pandemic doesn't last any longer than it has to. So take care, everybody. If you can still hear me, is it over? No, go ahead. Um, I've noticed in... Um, People are wearing two masks on television. Uh, they're wearing probably an N95 mask underneath a more decorative mask. And a lot of these uh, thin cloth masks are um, probably better than nothing. But um, if, you know, I, like I'll, I'll say if... Uh, I get vaccinated and our band starts playing in a 16 piece uh, jazz band. Um, we haven't been playing for a year now because uh, of this uh, pandemic. We start getting back together, especially since these people are blowing, I've got all these horn players. I'm going to wear an N95 mask underneath a regular <laughs> surgical mask. Also, I've seen a lot of popular fashion masks. In other words, people that look like models wearing masks, you know, wear this and you'll chic. But my understanding is the uh, synthetic ones, the polyester and stuff like that is not as effective as just a basic tight fitting several stage cotton mask. Right. And the N95 masks are pretty utilitarian. Um, so, um, uh, they put decorative masks on top of them. And Max mentioned uh, playing wind instruments or horns with a mask on. It's a, they do have filters they can put over the bell uh, to uh, uh, if these guys will use them. It's not all guys. It's some women too in the band. But uh, 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 at any rate, um, 
a lot of these people in this area where I am uh, in North Carolina are deniers and just, I don't know, ridiculous. And so they probably even now would uh, denigrate, you know, anyone taking too many precautions and uh, they have uh, cut back, I guess, at the uh, leadership of the person who sort of the band leader. Uh, but um, a lot of them didn't like it. <laughs> I think it's a microcosm. There have been so many bad mi mixed messages, bad messaging. It's been very dishonest. This is a deadly thing. It kills people. And if it doesn't kill you, it'll go through you and kill somebody else. So avoiding it is worthwhile. No, uh, surgeons don't refuse to wear masks. They don't. They would not. They would get reported. Nobody's. Uh, nobody's going to put up with that. Uh, but so essentially, our event is done today. But if you'd like to hang around um, and other questions or comments that come up and stuff like that, I'm sure that. Um, Dr. Hendricks or I will try to help. One thing I didn't mention is that uh, the lingering, about at least half of the population that gets COVID still has effects six months later. It's not just the flu and you get over it two weeks, you feel pretty decent again. Um, and uh, I heard Dr. Falsi, who looks extremely happy these days, talking that they're going to be doing uh, 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 research, that uh, uh, multidisciplinary research to try to figure out why there's this brain fog and persistent respiratory trouble, extreme fatigue. Um, it, this um, this infection has more pervasive spinoff effects on the individual and on society than just, you know, somebody getting a cold and getting over it. And uh, um, if you avoid it and you're alive after it's under control, you can go on with your life. If you're not, life will go on without you. That's all I know to say. I don't think that um, caution and uh, prudent uh, changes in social behavior and work uh, practices are likely to cause death like COVID is or cost to society. Shannon asks about COVID scarring the lungs or leaving adhesions. I, I know, like you said, that there are a lot of long-lasting effects. Yeah, it, uh, it destroys um, uh, alveolar cells, the uh, ACE inhibitor cells, that, in the type 2 uh, uh, epithelial cells in the uh, alveoli uh, are abundant, and they get killed, and you get inflammation that will scar up and damage alveoli and impair oxygen exchange, the ability to get carbon dioxide that's built up from your metabolism out and oxygen in, you know, in with the good air and out with the bad air. Um, so uh, scarring of the lungs definitely occurs in some, it's uh, extreme. Somebody does vaping or smoking or has other pulmonary problems, they're maybe more likely to get it. Some people that didn't have any of those will also end up with pulmonary compromise. Another social aspect, real quick, that uh, they keep uh, saying, you know, there's so many deaths, et cetera, but before somebody dies and uh, they're in the hospital, in the United States, my understanding is the average um, hospital costs for a stay with COVID is about $75,000. And that's 
partly paid for by insurance. Is that your understanding? I mean, in other words, it's not just the health issue, it's economics, it can be a, uh, being out of work, being out of family. It's, you don't want to get this stuff if you can help it. Right. And in terms of the medical costs, most insurances are capped and won't cover after a point. And the hospitals aren't going to get full reimbursement. Even if the hospitals are giving the vaccine and the vaccine is provided free, subsidized by the government, they have personnel and equipment right down to syringes and needles and alcohol swabs and band-aids um, and time. Uh, that is a cost to them. So there's a lot of expenses involved in any of this that may be overlooked. Okay, I'm kind of taking the um, pause there to mean we're done. <laughs> Just checking. Thank you to everyone who um, listened to all my uh, rambling and I um, appreciate your interest and uh, I hope I wasn't too confusing. No, you're wonderful. Thank you very much for uh, today and for last week and okay. we hopefully we're not going to have to do this again in a year from now yeah wouldn't that be great thank you synergy and kezar thank you maybe in a year from now, we'll have a world in which there's a sense of greater cooperation and uh, transparency and sense that all of humanity needs to look out for each other and stand together, not be so cutthroat and backstabbing and taking low shots. Okay, I, I had a, a question that uh, somebody raised is, uh, not to be morbid, but uh, when, if somebody dies of COVID, what happens as far as mortuary services and stuff? I mean, the people who handle the body are more at risk, are they not? Yes, uh, in New York, in the first wave, there were pictures that were widely distributed of people in hazmat suits doing mass burials on Staten Island. And um, generally funerals uh, are not happening and uh, are m much reduced. If they do happen, they're probably uh, not a good idea. And um, they bring people together in... Uh, small groups for one thing and um it's um oh where was it I, uh, san antonio um uh or el paso uh, maybe it was el paso i heard where they were talking about they have bodies uh, adding up faster than they can deal with them. Um, I really, um, you know, embalming involves putting a trocar into a major vessel and draining the blood out and injecting a lot of chemicals. Uh, it's good for pharaohs. Uh, to me, um, probably just, uh, um, outright um, the sealing and burial or cremation is 
better in terms of um, avoiding contamination. I'm so sorry, Katya. I'm very sorry. A service out the outside is probably a safer setting. Yeah, these are sad, dark times. We may talk about, you know, 400,000 dead in the U.S., 2 million, but every one of those is a person. Every one of those is a family member and a co-worker and... A human being. A human being. Yes. And my family, we always seem to have it, uh, cremation. Uh, and actually, I find that somewhat um, reassuring. Every mistake, every scar, every uh, misstep, it's all vaporized. And a cremation, that's the way I see it. Ashes to ashes. Yes. Yeah, there's a great deal of loss in this uh, society. And this is a time in 1920, there was still, that was, remember Calvin Coolidge, his son got a blister that got infected with uh, Staph aureus that um, got into his system and he got septicemia and died. The president of the United States, his son died while he was in office from a blister. Um, in 2020, we wouldn't have expected to be death to be looking over our shoulder that way were it not for COVID, we had gotten complacent. And that was something out there that we could keep at bay. Another question about ventilation real quick is, um, my understanding is in some buildings, of course, the air ex is exchanged quite a bit, good ventilation systems, but in other places where people congregate, perhaps, I'm not saying all restaurants, but that's one of the last places I would go, is the air may not be as well exchanged. Anything you know about that? Well, it brings to mind there was um, uh, research which involved um, people with expertise in engineering aerodynamics uh, in Korea, where they have, South Korea have done, has done a very good job in monitoring and trying to keep this under control. And uh, they had one teenager who was 20 feet away or more from an infected individual, uh, but there was a fan blowing. So the uh, particles that still had viable viral, uh, 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 you know, the aerosol that still had viable virus made it to him and he inhaled it sufficiently that he got uh, COVID. And um, so I think, you know, there's nothing like fresh air, but if you, uh, when I, I take a walk every evening, if somebody walks ahead of me, I go across the street and walk on the edge of the street I uh, don't walk behind them uh, because you can't see it, but they're leaving a trail just like they're leaving a trail of DNA that a bloodhound could track from the scent. Um, they're also leaving a trail of uh, aerosol in the air around them. And I also think of a time when a, Man in a red light uh, in the car ahead of me rolled down his window and blew cigar smoke out the window. 
And um, then the light changed and I drove forward. And just when I got, by the time I got across the road, uh, past the red light, I could smell that cigar smoke. I thought, you know, if he had tuberculosis, I would be breathing in tubercle particles, perhaps, if he had coughed out the window. So, uh, yeah, the thing about outside during the day is ultraviolet light will tend to uh, kill uh, anything that's got nucleic acids in it. I tend to think of the leaving a trail thing when I am in a grocery store. I try not to be in a grocery store long because there are aisles and you know people have been walking down the and in, in our area, some people don't even wear masks. So I'm rather <laughs> quick to get in and out if I have to get, go in at all. Which, um, by the way, I need to go because I've got a curbside pickup from a grocery store. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to leave. But uh, <laughs> thank you all for coming and uh, to Dr. Hendricks and to Chantel for hosting. It's um, this is amazing. This fireside uh, chat thing has worked out well, and I hope we have not just talked at you, but answered your uh, the things that concern you. Yes, this was uh, kind of a charming um, setting. Uh, thank you, Shanta. Very nicely put together. Thank you, Shiloh. So if there are no further questions, I guess I will hang it up. <laughs>